So hello and welcome to Inside Data Series uh, podcast. It's another Meet the Author interview today. Uh, and I'm joined by two stalwarts of the data technology and analytics industry, Jason Foster and Barry Green. Uh, gentlemen, lovely to have you here today. Can you please take the floor and uh, introduce yourselves? Uh, hi, uh, Barry Green. So um, I'm currently a... Um, a digital data architect and a product owner at uh, DSN. So it's a life sciences and uh, biosciences company. Um, and I'm basically doing a CDO role in disguise um, and uh, learning a lot and using a lot from the book. Jason. Cool. And hi, everyone. I'm Jason Foster. I'm the founder and CEO of Synergeur and uh, the CDO hub. Um, We'll, we'll both we'll get onto it, I'm sure, but but basically we're all about helping organisations to level up how good they are at using data to drive um, you know incremental business benefit and become data guided. Again, much of which we cover cover in the book. Fantastic, brilliant. Thank Thanks you. For so, yeah, Thanks for having us. having us, by the, the way. The, no problem at all. No problem. I mean, the reason here is to talk about the book. I've got a copy. There That's it is great. for those that need to see it. Um, so I read a bit of it and I listened to a bit of it as well. So hint there, there's an audio book available too. Um, <laughs> but got me thinking about our data at KDR, which we're not going to talk about because we'll be here pretty much all night, I think. Um, but you start the book by referring to ecosystems, connectivity, and kind of the evolution of organizations. How important do you feel data has become in the evolution of businesses over the past few years? Uh, I think I think there's a really interesting term in the forward, um, socio-technical, I think it is. It's not even in some dictionaries, apparently, but that kind of uh, says that data is pervasive across every part of society. Um, and I think there's been a lot of noise in the industry about, you know, data is important, data is an asset, but I uh, don't, really think that people quite grasp the the impact that data has if you if you really try to tackle it which is why we talked about an ecosystem and you know if you take the air out of the environment everyone dies uh, you know if the grass disappears because there's no um rain everything dies and it's kind of a bit like that right that data is kind of fundamental but it, it kind of relies on other things and so that's kind of why we talked about, it, about the ecosystem so for me, I think it's it's fundamentally important, but I still don't think people are grasping um, the real impact of if you tackle data properly, what it means for an organisation. Yeah, I think, and I, just to build on that, I think it's changed it changed the whole bunch, right? That there's it's all data is always um, certainly in the last you know twenty thirty years existed and and, and longer and, and people have been building reports and building then building dashboards then building data warehouses and 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 all of that was about kind of insight it was about trying to understand how's the business performing and and help and and help use that to deliver some improvement but but where and that's still really what people are trying to do right trying to kind of use data to improve the business in some way to benefit shareholders or customers or stakeholders. But the change really has been this this connectivity, this ecosystem, how pervasive data is in society, in organizations, whether we realize it or not, our kids, you know, grandpa, you know, everyone, everyone's impacted by it um, and grasping that and, and bringing that together and, and, and harnessing it and, and, and understanding that and then doing something about it is is really where people can start to, to drive some real value in their organizations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, data is just become everywhere hasn't it you uh, you just hear about it all the time um now so a lot of the first part of the book is also about change and the components of change and the importance of kind of thinking differently what would you say is the old way of viewing data and why is it now important to change the way we see data and its place within kind of the day-to-day -day business uh, just building on what I, I said really on that i think the um the old way is a little bit you know let's build some reports and understand what happened um but data can be so can be so much more than that it can it can help shape your thinking help shape your planned strategy help understand how your your current strategy is performing 
help change the way you interact with your customers, help improve processes, help, you know, um, uh, accelerate how you do things, help unpick what the problems that you've got in your business, help get you closer to your customer, drive better engagement. There's all these things that it can do if deployed correctly. It's not just about kind of saying, well, how did we perform before? It's about applying it to, to accelerate and move forward and, and create more adaptable organizations which is something we talk about in the book so how, how do you use data to enhance the level of adaptability that your business has so that it can adjust and pivot and, and sort of you know change based on what's happening in the in the environment like things like pandemics coming coming along you know those that were good at data were able to better sort of you know steer themselves around the problems that were being had yeah yeah and i, th I think too that um data people have been guilty of of, of kind of try to implement data in what I call the um, IBM 1970s model, right? Where, you know, you, you set up a data function and they were all about command and control. Um, and there was no real connection. They, they were almost a silo in, in of themselves, right? And things were done for data sake rather than for the business, as Jason has, has kind of alluded to, right? Um, and, and I think that that's also changing. People are realizing that, you know, with this connectedness, data almost becomes a conduit to kind of get the organization to, to connect right and so um that, that's but that's also a really big change because um data has to be seen as everyone's responsibility i think we kind of we kind of say that in the book right and, and again it's a lot of people have advocated responsibility because it's, they didn't understand it or they thought it was too hard um and that created that's created a lot of problems which is good if you're fixing things up now but <laughs> but it's not so good because the problems have been going on for a long time and so the, the the kind of scars are quite deep yeah yeah it's interesting because it's not it's a it's a change of kind of everything isn't it a, a attitude understanding uh operate you know operational change sort of everything um you kind of go down the route of adopting this sort of start startup mentality I quite, I, I really love that. I like the opportunity that you can try something that you think could work. You can fail at it. You can learn from it. You can iterate and, Im and improve. And I think yeah. that's important in sort of all aspects of life, business and, and everything else. Sort of it's that sort of don't, don't give up and, um, you know, learn from what you've done rather than just sort of can it. Um, startups don't always work though, as we know. A lot of ideas come from gut feeling and from what we think is our underlying sort of expertise and, and knowledge, not necessarily from data. Um, so wh why are data initi initiatives different to just a general sort of startup? Um, and will adapting that sort of startup philosophy guarantee success? No, I mean, no, no, nothing, nothing guarantees success. But I, I think there's two important bits about the startup mentality here. One is this is about a mentality. This is about taking the things about startups that um, are really great, which, and which the great ones do, which is testing, um, learning and iterating on, on an idea and only taking forward the things that, that are successful. So in that respect, you you got you <clears throat> excuse me you increase the chances of success because you're only moving forward and investing heavily in the things that are proven to be to be good and right and proper and and add value. You know they built you've built credibility. We talk about in the book the um, the story of Airbnb and Chesky and Gebbia where they tested the idea of renting out a room in in their loft um, because there weren't any hotel rooms in San Francisco at the time and a bunch of people showed up that on the first night and you know unless they I mean, who would have thought that you do that, just offer a room to a bunch of strangers and now everybody does it and it's a global phenomenon. But they mm. tested that idea, they proved that it worked and then they scaled it. And that's the kind of mentality here, you know, with data, it's not about building a, an AI algorithm and then and a, a, a huge expense and take ages to do it. And then hopefully it works. You, you, you start low fi and you test, you iterate, you build, you add data sets, you improve it. And then, then it's worth investing and putting it in production and making it successful. So that's the mentality that this is about. It's not about being a startup. It's just taking some of those learnings and applying them to the data lens. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, cool. So I'm, I will never picture a smoothie in the same way again, I don't think, um, <laughs> when I buy one. So you'll have to read or listen if you uh, want to find out what I mean. But um, talk us through the level up framework briefly 
um, uh, how important do you think as part of not just that framework is your sort of personal brand and data brand? How important are they as well when creating sort of data products and, and services? Is that Barry or do you want me to give it a go? Uh, you can give it a go and then, and then, I'll, and then I'll basically we'll build on it. So, I mean, um, it's a yeah, you're... thing, Jason, that we, that we spend some time debating the whole products and services thing and, and, and trying to get it clear just between yeah. us, right? So, uh, hopefully the book does that, um, uh, well, but, but we, we debated this really heavily, didn't we? Because it's a, such an important concept. We did, and um, and and yeah, I'll, I'll leave the uh, the mystique about what you mean by uh, the smoothie uh, mark to, to people to read the book. But the, the 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 important component underpins quite a lot of stuff in in the market at the moment that are really good concepts around sort of like data product management, data mesh, um, data ops, and the fu the sort of underpinning thing here is treating data as a product and and treating things like dashboards that you build, models that you build. Um, you know, algorithms that you build as products in their own right and, and products need to serve a purpose they need to have features and benefits they need to have kpis you need to track whether they're doing well or not you need to keep the ones that are and drop the ones that aren't you need to have someone who's looking after it to make sure it's fed and watered and getting better and improving and iterating so data as a product is what that's all about and there's a kind of like a, an alignment with with making a smoothie that we, that we bring to the table to help sort of articulate what we mean by it so, so that kind of whole idea of, of building data products and then treating those things as products like you would a phone or a, or a laptop or a pair of shoes or some bread, you know, that, that's really important. Um, and we've seen it really successfully deployed um, because it, it sort of puts a, a more of a focus on, on the thing that you build and not just a, a throwaway thing that you put out there and hope someone uses the dashboard or hope someone uses a data set. So that's kind of where that all came from. And, and um and the services point, the, the data data services is the is the things that you need to wrap around uh, the data products to make sure that they that they work. The the training, the education, the 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 tracking, the processes that make sure that these data products remain intact and improving all the time. Yeah, and the and the and the key thing for me around the products and services thing is that people talk about data, but depending on the context, it can mean a million different things, right? And so you want to, you almost want to be, get the narrative to be, I need to do this. So I, you know, I need to do data quality because my data is poor quality. That's, you know, okay, good. We can now roll out a product and the service to help you do that. So we want people to talk about the things they need to get from data. And you can do that quite clearly with products and services rather than just talking about data, right? Because it, it's, it's almost a little bit ambiguous um, if you just talk about data all the time. Yeah. Can you deliver a product without a service or a service without a product? Yeah, I suppose you can. It, it sort of depends what the product is. And, and sometimes that needs more, more of a, a service wrapped around it than, than others. But I think the, the key thing is that you, that you sort of understand what problem you're trying to solve, like something like customer acquisition or, you know, a problem in your supply chain or, you know your your um you know opposite some operational inefficiencies somewhere and, and you're using you're building data products to help unpick the problem and, and make it better and the data products that you have uh, are then are then you know you, you improve them and if they stop being valuable then stop using them or if they stop delivering any benefits stop using them but if they continue to deliver benefit great and they might be as, as such that they need the services wrapped around them so that um that people understand how to use them and that they're using them in the right way yeah yeah okay cool um i know you love this one jason so this one is just for you why is oh, okay data... oh god <laughs> <laughs> why is data not the new oil oh right yeah um yeah so i mean i ha i basically i hate the phrase data is the new oil um so yeah, d data is not the new oil is my phrase. Is my phrase, and I, my friend Scott Taylor, the data whisperer, we we uh, he's he's my buddy with this around around data not being the new oil. Uh, there's loads of sort of specific reasons, right, about about it being this you know similar. There's some some similarities, some differences, but the thing I hate about it actually is the connotation. So the connotation around data and 
being oil and the connotations around oil and fat cats and it ruining the environment and doing bad things and a few sort of very rich people and everyone else hasn't got it. That's the thing I don't really like about it. And, and when you think about oil, it normally conjures up some negative, you know, about the environment and all this sort of stuff. So I just don't like the thing that it makes you think when you say it. There's some really things like, you know, um, where it's there's some fundamental functional differences like it's finite it's created in certain parts of the world whereas you know data is not finite and it created everywhere and created all the time and it's infinite and but there's some things where it's it, and there's other bad things that it's very similar like it can be um it can damage individuals it can damage the environment you know all the processing power to you know mine bitcoins and and process mm -hmm. um you know our algorithms that we're all that we're all running um, so it can damage the environment. There's some people that are that are sort of, you know, the head of all the data. You think of people like Zuckerberg who have sort of sat on a gold mine in terms of data and there's a bunch of other people that aren't. So there's some similarities and negatives, there's similarities and positives. I just hate the connotations basically. So I don't think it's a helpful analogy for people to use with with board members and leadership teams to try and get them to understand data. So I just mm. say we we ditch it from the vernacular. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I have to add to that that generally there's a there's a whole industry around creating these, this noise in the market around data and it's confusing, right? And the reason, one of the reasons we wrote the book is because, and, and wrote it in a way that we hope people could understand, it's simple, is because to get rid of all that noise and get people to actually understand that, you know, it's not that complicated, but it's super difficult to, you know, execute. And mm. if you're going to do it, you kind of need to understand it and understand these kind of key concepts and not have all that kind of, marketing hypey noise that's kind of as pervasive within the market if you like yeah yeah that's what i took from reading the book i mean it, you, it's it it makes it sound easy you read this and you go and implement this you're done and dusted one month bish bash bosh we've got loads of money and whatever um but obviously it's not quite like that is it and um i think there's a big difference between kind of wants and, and needs so people kind of, they know what they want. They don't necessarily know what they need. How do you kind of dig out those true needs of, of the business when people know what they want and the wants are always more kind of uh, prevalent? Um, are there some components that are critical regardless of the needs and wants, um, like data management, for example? Yeah, so, so, so it's interesting. So um, I've seen this again and again where people run off and hire a whole lot of data scientists and focus on the fancy visualization tools and then wonder why things don't work, right? Because the data scientists don't have the data they need um, and you know, the visualization tools are spitting out rubbish. It, it, you've got that, that foundation is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a kind of cliche, but you've got to build that foundation and you've got to build a strong foundation that can scale, right? We talk about building it and then scaling it because if you don't have that foundation, it just makes things so hard. And you generally got to go and fix or redo things again until you get that foundation in place. Mm. So you actually by trying to take shortcuts, you actually create it, you make it harder and you, and you basically create more work. It might, it might seem that it's a shortcut, but, but, you know, there is no silver bullet and, and there are no shortcuts. Um, but that's why we talk about doing things small and incrementally and then getting them ready to scale, right? So you can you can build a whole lot of a broad range of products and services and then scale them as you need to. Um, but if you don't have those core foundational products and services, you, you're kind of on a hiding to nothing, really. Yeah, I, th I think the other one for me is... Um... Uh, the regardless of who who you are, the business you are, the thing, the the sort of ex where you, where you currently are in terms of maturity, the the number one thing that helps you win the most is aligning everything you do to the business outcome you're trying to impact. So we are, we often go into organisations and talk to organisations who have kind of got a, a sort of data strategy all focused around building capabilities. Great, you need those capabilities but haven't particularly aligned what they do or why they've got them to the business outcome they're trying to achieve, the alignment to their business strategy, the alignment to you know some operational improvement that they're trying to make. So the number one thing that, that we sort of advocate in the book and, and so sort of we talk to clients about now is, is, is identify the size of the prize, identify what you're trying to achieve here, and then build your capabilities around delivering on that, that value. And if the opportunity is tomorrow and, and uh, you know, Excel spreadsheet, enables you to build a data set and get some insight to deliver that value tomorrow then do it 
because if you spend six months trying to build something in order to deliver the value that's tomorrow, then you're going to miss the opportunity. So it's kind of right sizing what you do and focusing it around those, those outcomes. Otherwise you're just building capabilities and being a cost center, which, which is no, no, you know, you don't last very long as a CDO or as a data function or get more, more um, budget without, without sort of delivering value, which is like the most important thing. Yeah. yeah. And there's a real level of pragmatism that needs to be applied yeah. because you can, you can get, like I, I kind of alluded to the fact that a lot of data people will kind of create data things for data's sake right yeah. <laughs> and that pragmatism is super important yeah yeah how do you nerd all the tough cookies the, the i want i want and i'm used to getting what i want how do you say well that you know that you might want that that's not what you need so, so jason's kind of alluded to it for, for me i always talk about the organization outcomes right so the organization is looking for these things and actually what you want is kind of aligned to that, but we need to do these things to, to enable the organization to do it. So you put it in a language that effectively they can understand, but also you kind of, um, I think you need to point out, I don't know about you, Jason, but I, I find you need to point out to people that they exist in an organization and, you know, the organization is wanting these things and it's not just up to them to, to, to basically um, it's not just what they want, it's what the organization needs, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. you've got to be, you've got to, got to point that out in, a, in either a nice way or a straightforward way, depending on who you're talking to and how the organization is. <laughs> yeah, it, that's, this is some, you know, we talk, the, the industry talks a lot about culture change and, and culture change, actually, part of that is, is almost growing up and focusing on and having a grown up conversation, sorry, about the relative priorities, because you know, in a department, your number one priority might be your number one priority, but stacked up against an organization's priorities, there's something else that might either pip it or be way, way higher. So, so it's about having a grown up conversation about how, how do we, how do we achieve all the things we want to achieve and how do we focus on the things that are going to add most value? Um, if you're in a great situation where there's a whole load of use cases that could add loads of value. And you can start proving that then that just increases your chances of getting investment so if you've built credibility of saying if we apply data to a problem and we've shown that by doing that we can improve a, an outcome cool you've proven that data is good in your organization and, and therefore you can help drive investment so you asked the question about the level up framework before that's all about really earning the right to get to spend the company's money in order to mm. grow your capability because that enables you to deliver more value now you only earn the right to to get money if you've delivered value I mean, it doesn't always work that way in companies some 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 teams and organizations give cash and and they spend it and then a year later we just have to try and prove well, what value did we deliver what's they've got nothing to compare back to so that yeah. that, that for me is just a grown-up conversation really yeah, yeah it's also about understanding the components that that are needed to kind of deliver the outcome as well because yeah. you know sometimes you, you, you can't have a smoothie without certain components right okay. <laughs> and yeah, and need to, need to prepare the components and get them ready before you can have your smoothie. Yeah, absolutely. I really absolutely. want a smoothie now. Yeah, yeah I know. Too. I've got some water. <laughs> I'm thinking, where's the fruit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the book. You're quite clear in the book. This is not a necessarily a distinct step by step how to guide. More of kind of an overarching framework and and um sort of uh sort of higher level guide to kind of data data strategy the um the bread in the sandwich if we're referring to food again i'm getting a bit hungry actually now um but the the filling within that is very much situationally specific isn't it so mm. what what would your advice be to to our listeners who are entering into their own sort of scale up phase um and specifically those who might be struggling to kind of innovate and there's certain challenges there about sort of innovation On Barry, where, where are you focused on your your current role, early stage? Well, uh, we, we're basically trying to to enable innovation in the organisation, right? So um, we have a big R and D um, part of the organisation, and the problem is that you know they haven't got access to all the we haven't got access to all the data that's that's um, produced for the machine learning models and for people to start you know getting that that value out. Um, but I think it's um. So I think that's one thing you, you need to kind of be an enabler, but, it, but it come, for me, it all comes back to the, you know, we talked about business outcomes 
um, building, you might be building lots of different things at different at different paces, depending on what, what the um, what the need is in the organisation. And then sometimes that's not it's just not about being innovative; it's just about being building the, the foundation so that you know other parts of the organisation um, can do a bit of experimentation. And then when you're ready, you, they can kind of accelerate that accelerate um, that innovation. Yeah, I think those are early stages. It's all about building credibility, build credibility, prove value. Um, number two, two things: build credibility, prove value. Focus on that. Focus on that. You, you get buy-in. You get you build relationships. You get people interested. You get people pulling the thing rather than you having to push it on them. So build credibility uh, and prove value. Um, on the innovation point, it's a really interesting one because again, culture culture shapes and dictates this a little bit. Um, how innovative and open to investing in things that don't necessarily have a clear deliverable or clear outcome or clear benefit um but but in data i think you can build an environment like technically speaking build an environment but also um um sort of conceptually sp speaking build an environment that that is about innovation it's about testing it's about learning it's about improving um you've got an environment where you can try out new data sets you can try out you know new algorithms or different content to that algorithm to see if you can create produce a better prediction you, know, you need a physical environment to do that in and, and your technology platform needs to enable you to, to do it and culturally you need a you need a you know to be given budget you need to be given space and time to to try new things um, there's no fast way to do that and it's sort of led a little bit based on the culture of the organization and whether that's like an acceptable thing to do yeah yeah i like the thought that you can um start with foundations and let other people kind of uh you know um you use that to make their own sort of experimentation and innovation and then you've added value elsewhere where you you know where you weren't even focusing it's quite nice well, well it's um, quite a, that's quite cultural cultural as well because it you do you centralize innovation or do you enable innovation across the business and i'm quite an advocate of open and collaborative so push it out and let everyone innovate because that's where great ideas come from yeah and if you if you think about an organization so product market and customer if you're doing the same things year after year after year, at some point, someone's going to come and do something different, right? So you have to be mm. innovating these days and especially yeah. with digital and channel, you know, the way things are moving, you have to be innovating. So you can't not innovate, but you know, you need to do it in the right way. It's like everything yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, I mean, I don't, I know the answers to, the, to this question. How much importance would you put on culture? A lot it's pretty much been in every answer we've spoken about since we started chatting. Um, so I'll swiftly move brush over that because we know that's important specifically data culture topics like data literacy, so on and so forth. How important is that? Not, not only how important is it, but how important is it to kind of get it right? So, so I don't think you're going to implement the change you need if you don't, get the broad consensus across the organization. And I, so I think that, you know, you can, it makes your job super hard if you can't communicate to your key stakeholders initially, but, but that, you know, the whole, the whole ethos of data is everyone's responsibility. If, if no one else believes that, but you, you're in big trouble, right? <laughs> so, you know, you need to start out with a key key influences in the organization, not necessarily always the, the top people in the organization, but key influences in the organization and then effectively get them to be, you know, get your message out so that effectively it goes viral through the right through the right people. Um, and I've always worked on a principle of really simple messages over and over and over again until until people were kind of almost telling you what you what you're trying to get across to them. And then that you kind of know you're making some success when when all of a sudden the things that you're saying other people are parroting back to you as if they they invented it right which is kind of a nice place to be mm. the, li the literacy thing's important important there isn't it because the i mean it, literacy is basically about having an organization that understands the need and the value of having data and using data to drive decision making decision making and the capability to do it top to bottom so senior leadership to you know um you know frontline staff and analytical people and this isn't about teaching everyone to code python this is about having an organization that's that has the kind of intelligence to to improve their decision making by applying data to it and and so it's it, sort of the question of how important is literacy it's almost it's almost like saying 
you know, there's an, we, we invented cars, but didn't teach anyone to drive them. I'd probably come up with a better metaphor if I thought about it, but you know, if you've got a capability, sorry, if you've got a physical thing, data, and you don't have anyone who can sort of use it in the right way, then, then there's no point. You may as well go home. So it's sort of, it's symbiotic with, with having a data strategy is having an organization that's literate enough to, to be able to sort of, um, use it in, in the right way. Yeah. How do you identify these, these influences? Would you say, are they individuals? Are they business areas? Are they a, a certain technology that people are really in, invested in? What, you know, how would you define what that sort of influence is? We, we, Barry, we've got that uh, matrix in the book, haven't we, about stake, stakeholder buy-in and, and it's kind of how, how, how much experience does an individual have in seeing data work before in an organization and how much do they believe and buy in to the fact that your organization that they're currently in can do it. And so your influencers really, and your champions and your change agents are the ones that really understand the value for this organization that we're in today. And they're likely to have had some experience of it being successful elsewhere. And then you harness those people, you, you, you sort of, you bring them inside the tent, if you like, to, to become the salesman in or person internally within an organization to, to for, push the message, to, to shout, to cheerlead, to champion, to tell other people. Um, but it's kind of, bo- it's a pincer. I often talk about it. it's like bottom, uh, sorry, bottom up and top down. You need some senior stakeholder um, engagement and buy-in um, board level, senior leadership team, board minus one, something like that. But you also need a hell of a lot of people um, uh, sort of, um, uh, ratio speaking at the, at the kind of grassroots that are kind of pushing to pushing the agenda, trying things out, testing some things out, doing some things differently. So you've got to kind of get all of that, that mix, right. To, to kind of get that, that sort of change to happen. Yeah. And I, I think Jason, you talked about it earlier where you've got to deliver something, right? So if you can solve a mm. problem that hasn't been solved before, where you can at least start that showing one. that that problem solvable, all of a sudden you find people who are whining and moaning about everything, they start to go, wow, actually that's, that's never been done before. I mean, that then starts to give you the credibility. I think we've talked about this too, Jason, you know, just to, just to start getting more, um, making more impact in the organization because more people get on board. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And things scale from there. And obviously that's what we, we talk about, um, uh, a lot. I mean, scale, when you say scaling, I think everyone automatically thinks growth. Um, what about flex? So if things need to be scaled up, they might also need to be scaled back. External factors might, mm. you know, impact that quite easily. Yeah. So what, what would your top tip be to ensure that there's some flexibility in your data strategy when you need to flex resource, budget, technology? Could be any of those things, I guess, couldn't it? Well, the whole, the whole thing needs to be adaptable. So I, I talked about earlier on the, the need to, you're, you're basically doing this stuff to help your organization to become adaptable and, and adapt around, you know, co- you know, pandemics and, and leadership changes and, you know, um, political environment change, regulation changes. So it, an organization needs to be adaptable and the data strategy can help. Um, but the data strategy in, in of itself needs to be adaptable. And, and there's different ways you do that. The, the operating model is a really important one. The operating model needs to allow for agility, react, reactivity, um, and adaptability, of course. Um, your technology platform, you know, if you're, if you're locked into a single vendor, for example, it's really difficult to put in a new component. But if you've created a, an ecosystem of technology, API-driven, that enables you to sort of decouple different parts of your ecosystem your platform then you can take things away you can add them um, of course dialing up and down your team you know if you've got a full fte headcount then you know that's sort of in hr territory but if you've got a mix of you know um bench resource and 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 contract resource and consultancy resource or whatever then then you have a bit more of ability to kind of flex up and down based on what's around you but that just comes down to sort of how you manage people how you man- how you manage budgets Barry, i don't know if you've seen something different in your cdo roles yeah, it's, it's more the experience I've had um, uh, kind of re-engineering um, businesses and things where just understanding what you what I call keep the lights on, costs, uh, resources, mm-hmm. what you need to do to keep going when, you know, everything's kind of against you or you want to kind of get ready for sale. It's about, you almost need to kind of keep that in your, in your back of your mind. 
Um, so, you know, that if I had to cut my team in half or I had, you know, what would I give away? What could I stop doing, but still make sure the organization functions to the right level, right? Um, and that's, that's a, it's almost a difficult thing to think about, but I think you do need to be thinking about those things because, you know, you never know what's coming around the corner. So, so it's always useful to kind of have that in the back of your mind in terms of being prepared for something that may not be obviously coming down the, you know, coming yeah. down the corner. Yeah, I think, you know, we all talk about COVID quite a lot. It's a theme I think we will be for a long time, but that's a perfect example, you know, isn't it? That no one was kind of prepared for that. And I guess it's probably now people have got people thinking, actually, we do need some, uh, you know, contingency plans or the ability to be flexible. Um, there's, there's no getting around the fact that sometimes cost um, challenges will hit an organisation and they need to flex. But I think where data teams can struggle more is if it's not clear what value they're adding because you tend not to strip out costs unless you have to in an area that's adding value so if you can become a you know incremental business driver and a, and a profit center rather than pure cost center and everyone's clear on what that is and that you're 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 communicating it all the time when there are cost pressures then it's like well, we let's not touch the data function because they're the ones that are going to help us get out of this rather than mm. it being, you know, let's strip out that team. Cause we're not really sure what they're doing and they're just a cost. And do we really need those reports right now? So I think you can do some stuff to prepare for it. Not, it's not about protecting your empire, but it's about finding ways to add value so that when the question about value comes along, you, you're kind of, you're, you're all good. And yeah. ideally you should, you should be helping the organization automate as much as possible. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's sort of, so people, I know people talk about data a lot, but the metadata is becoming, a lot you know probably more important in my view because there's so much you can do with metadata if it's curated properly in terms of automation and driving change and stuff that um so, so you know, again you just need to be doing the right things which i think you know is, is obvious from what we said in the book yeah yeah perfect right last question now um I'll try and make it interesting um so what would you say is the most successful outcome you've seen personally by using the level up framework yeah nice one um i think um I, level up framework on its own doesn't doesn't do anything but i think the, the con the, all the concepts in the book I, I think the best example i've probably seen is um and I, unfortunately i can't name who, who it is but a major retailer um and um and and the the objective was to um, to better protect the um, the kind of the customer base, protect the customer base in terms of um, uh, uh, the, the the amount they shop, the amount they return, the amount they spend, but also create more of those people that are kind of good customers at the sort of top end. Um, and by applying a kind of like targeted, personalised um, marketing focus on those people, rather than kind of above the line discounts for everybody, um, we're able to return kind of two percent incremental. Uh, revenue on a on a FTSE 100 business so you kind of you kind of took a the same spend that you're going to spend on discounts and put them below the line and targeted messages at individual people or cohorts of people um you could see a much better sort of redemption rate on offers and vouchers and that drove a really sort of fascinating and great incremental business value which funded a whole bunch of other stuff off the back of it so that, that was a good one for me cool for me, it was, it's, it's more about the change that I've seen in an organization. So by doing these things, an organization of complete detractors with only one or two people supporting mm. the change in 18 months was completely turned around in terms of the, the organization was actually leading change acro across the kind of even across the globe, which was quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And business value um, in that as well, um, undoubtedly. Fantastic. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Jason, for your time. Um, who, who wants to let everybody know where they can get the book and or audio book? So the book is the uh, best place to go for it is Amazon. It's also on Waterstones and Barnes and & Noble, but amazon.co.uk or .com. Um, the audio uh, book is available basically on every audio book platform, but again, Audible is probably the, the most well-known, the Amazon one. So, um, so yeah, we'd love to, we'd love to hear about people sort of reading or listening, leave us, a, leave some feedback, get in touch. We'd love to see what people think, challenge our ideas. 
um, everything in the book's been been implemented somewhere but we're always improving the thinking behind it and so yeah we'd love to hear people's thoughts on it as well yeah okay they'd love to hear the feedback fantastic cheers guys thanks for having us mark thanks mike